morning, church. It is Baptism Sunday. Amen. So today, we are going to see a picture of the old life being put away and the new life emerging. Right? When we're baptized, we are making a public confession of our faith in and commitment to Jesus Christ. Amen. I just love Baptism Sunday. And we have some amazing young men and women who are going to be baptizing, who are going to be getting baptized this morning and making this important declaration. So why don't you go ahead and be seated and we will get started. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 12 at my first summer tribe. Little did I know how much I would need the Lord in the next 10 years. The following summer after that, a situation occurred that resulted in me no longer seeing my father. My dad was the first man to break my heart. But I've learned over the years that I will always have a heavenly father. At 15, I met my late husband, Anthony. I was terrified of being in a relationship and giving someone the opportunity to break my heart again. I remember praying, God, I'm stepping out in faith. I'm scared. Please carry me. And he did. At 18, we got engaged. At 20, we got married. And now at 22, I'm a widow. I never understood what God's grace looked like or felt like until now. I want to be a little more like Jesus each day. It looks like giving people grace, forgiving, and doing my best to love, even when maybe I don't feel like it. I'm getting baptized today because there is no time like now. As 1 Peter 3, 21 says, And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm saved and I'm continuing continuing to work on trusting that God has a better plan for me than I do. God, you are good and I'm so thankful for what Jesus did on the cross. Wow, amen, yes. Avery. Avery, why don't you go ahead and tell us why you wanna be baptized this morning? Because Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen, I like it, all right. Grace and I've been a Christian my whole life due to my circumstances for many years. I was very lukewarm. I knew of God, but I didn't really know God. My life was a mess. I lived in bad conditions and abuse. I was spiritually very tormented and severely oppressed by many demons. I was attacked with a suicidal spirit and many others. Only God could help me and no one else, so I started seeking Him out. When I truly got a relationship with God and really knew Him, He worked miracles in my life. He delivered me, He healed me, and He brought me to repentance. I ended up having a supernatural encounter with Jesus that radically changed who I was. Worldly desires lost importance, and all I have wanted to do from then is serve Jesus. He completely changed me in my life. I could not have survived what I went through without God. I am getting baptized today because I am madly in love with Jesus and he has put it on my heart to be baptized just as Jesus was as I am a new creation.
Amen. Grace, why don't you tell us why you would like to be baptized this morning? Well, I think obedience is important, and Jesus himself got baptized, so I want his desires to be my desires. Jesus was about five or six years ago. I was on the train heading to Nova Scotia for work. I was going to meet the foreman and other co-worker there. As I was alone on the train, I had a lot of thinking I did about my past, present, and future. How much trouble I've been in with drugs and alcohol and just making bad decisions. Just thinking on the right things or path I should be following. When I arrived in Nova Scotia, it was late so I had to stay in a hotel for the night before heading to the job site the next morning. It was that night I felt something strange around me, so I didn't really know exactly what it was or what to do, so all I did was sit down on the bed and said, Lord, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I want to accept you into my heart. I didn't know it back then, but I do know now that it was the Holy Spirit that I felt that night, and that is why I want to be baptized today to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and be cleansed of all sin and be reborn. Amen. So, Peyton, why don't you tell us why you want to be baptized this morning? Well, just as my video there, my testimony says to be uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, cleansed of all sin and be reborn. Awesome. My name is Daniel David Natsikwood. I was born in Iqaluit, Nunavut. I knew there was a God from a young age and became a Christian at the age of 10. As my life moved on, I served many masters who took me to very dark places. Now I want to make a public confession of my decision to give my heart to Jesus and accept him as my Lord and Savior. Thank you to all my family and friends who have helped me make this decision. I also want to thank the Boys Gym Club of America for their encouragement over the past nine years. All right. Daniel, why don't you want to tell us why you want to be baptized this morning? I want to make a public confession of my uh, faith and commitment to Jesus. Amazing. Kids have been dismissed, yeah? And they're walking, they're walking their way up. <clears throat> Need to give these kids an applause for restraining themselves. Great to see you all here this morning. Isn't it awesome to see people baptized, following Jesus? Come on. Yeah. I just, you know, really, I, I just don't, I can't think of anything more exciting than to see people who, and hear the, hear the stories of how people have come to Jesus. You know, I, to me, it, it never gets tired. You know, it is a it's a living demonstration of the good news, that the good news is still good news because people are responding to Jesus and they're coming to know him. So it's an amazing thing. It's amazing grace. Yes. All right. Well, um, I want to, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna forget about that. I'm gonna take a deep dive into, uh, into our series. We began a series last week on the person of the Holy Spirit, and I'm excited, expectant about wonderful things that I believe are gonna take place as, as we just continue to focus on this, and um, 
believing that it will position us for a, a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit. How many know it's just not information, but it's uh, the living reality of the, the power and life of the Spirit that we need in all of our lives and in the church. Thank you for that one amen, I really appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, you know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll take whatever we can get this morning. You know, I, I just wanna say something to you. Saying amen or, or just shouting, yeah! Uh, or even saying, yeah. Um, you know, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It encourages the preacher. I, I, will, I will honestly tell you, my son, uh, my oldest son, Nathan, who was here in the summer and shared the word, he was telling me, he said, you know, Dad, uh, I went to this church in West Virginia this week, so it was just last weekend. And he said, you know, it's a smaller church. And quite frankly, he doesn't minister in a lot of smaller churches. Probably most of the churches he speaks in are into the thousands and even tens of thousands. And so, um, so he said, you know, I went to this small church in, in West Virginia. And he said, Dad, have you ever been to West Virginia? I said, I think I drove through a corner of it. <laughs> a couple of years ago on vacation. And he said, yeah, he said, well, you know, it's, it's known as the forest state, and it's, yeah, it's just a forest. He said, do you know what the median income is? And I said, I haven't a clue. He says, $32,000 a year is the median income. So in other words, this is, this is not a rich state. This is not where a lot of people make a lot of money. There's a lot of uh, mining and fracking and all that kind of stuff, and, and wages are, are fairly low. And so he said, you know, I went to this church, it was 600 people, and um, he said, you know, while I preached, he said, it was so hard. And I said, why is that? And he goes, well, they don't talk back to you. You know, they just, they just kind of look at you. And he says, so I didn't know if I was connecting or not connecting. He says, it's kind of like preaching at your church. He said, Dad, your, your church is one of the hardest churches to preach to because they just look at you. And, and you know, last Sunday morning, I was actually, when I was preaching, I was at a point uh, in one of the services, I can't remember which one, so I'm not blaming you, um, that I remember thinking, are they with me or are they against me? You know, are they, is, uh, like some kind of response would be nice. So, you know, I just wanna educate you that you're really helping the preacher when you say, yeah, you know, if you think amen is too religious, don't worry about the amen, just go, yeah, or cool, or right on, or right arm, or, you know, whatever you wanna say, but yeah, yeah, just keep it up, keep it going. Don't, don't go quiet on me. It really helps the preacher. Yeah, that's, how many found that was useful information? Huh? Good, good, good. Thank you, appreciate it. So last week we began to uh, unpack what Jesus was speaking to the disciples as he was preparing them for a transition from, from him personally uh, in his flesh to the Holy Spirit. So we're gonna go back and kind of pick it up where we left off. If you didn't get last week's message, recommend you listen to it. And uh, this is gonna be part of a longer series that we're gonna get into uh, throughout this month and probably October and maybe into November. Uh, just we'll see where we go, but I really wanna kind of unpack fresh the Holy Spirit. And so um, we're gonna pick it up last week, uh, the 14th chapter of John's Gospel, which is all, you know, from basically John 13 right through to 17 is known as the upper room discourse. Uh, so in uh, verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you today for your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit will come and illuminate our hearts and bring fresh uh, bread to us, Lord, from heaven that speaks to us and reminds us of everything that you are speaking to us in Jesus' name. And everybody said. So first of all, I wanna deal with the question that Judas, by, by the way, this Judas, not Iscariot, uh, most scholars believe was, was the guy by the name of Thaddeus, who uh, is named that in, in the Gospels. And um, 
Jesus had earlier said, you know, I will come to you, uh, but the world will not see me. But you will see me because you've known me. And so now Thaddeus is like, okay, how is that going to happen? And how are you going to manifest yourself to us but, but, but not to the world? And it's kind of noteworthy that Jesus um, doesn't directly answer this question. I don't know about you, but I have found that just in praying and waiting on God and for probably three decades now, I have made a habit of journaling and praying and trying to have like two-way communication with God. And, um, and I've found that when I ask him questions, uh, he rarely answers what I want. How many have found that? You know, that God speaks what he wants to speak and he doesn't kind of operate by our agenda. Now, sometimes he does, but um, generally you can ask him a question and he will go somewhere else. He's just glad that you're listening. He's, he's glad that he's got your ears for a few minutes. So looking at the question, we can respond today because of where we are. When we, when we think of where we are today on the other side of Pentecost and uh, a couple thousand years of Christianity and experience with the Holy Spirit, we understand that how God can, how Jesus could come and manifest himself to them and yet people not see it. And so it's just because he's invisible, yet he is real and active. Uh, it's like the idea that without a radio, uh, radio waves go unnoticed. How many know that, you know, if you've got a phone and you send a text or you're looking to look something up uh, on Safari or, or whatever you use, you know that you're catching those radio waves because the information is appearing on your phone. But it's invisible. You know, isn't it amazing? You can send a text from your little, basically, computer and you can send that around the world in a matter of seconds. And then some people say, well, I don't believe in God. How could he hear prayer? Duh, <laughs> duh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Have you got a phone? <laughs> I guess God's never figured that technology out. You know. So the Holy Spirit is unnoticed by the unbeliever whose spiritual life is not connected to the living God. I wouldn't say that they don't have a spiritual life. As we heard one of the testimonies today of someone who was demonized, uh, that, that's a spiritual life. It's just not a healthy one. Amen? And things get a lot healthier when you get connected with the living God. And so we sometimes wonder why unbelieving people can't see and understand what we see and understand. Just remember the radio illustration. You have to have the radio to get the signal. Paul kind of refers to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse three. He says, therefore, I make known to you that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. So if you're speaking by the Spirit and you call Jesus accursed, uh, it's not the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we have some people in our family circles who would call Jesus accursed. Uh, but we know that they don't have the Holy Spirit. They do have some spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. And then he says, no one can say that Jesus is Lord. In other words, no one can really truly understand, see, and confess that except by the Holy Spirit. So with the Spirit, you cannot misrepresent him. And without the Spirit, you can't identify him. Okay, number one, I want to give you about six points, and we're going to be done here, but six points from this passage. Number one, what it means to love Jesus. What it means to love Jesus. Jesus defines what it means to love him in this passage, and you and I do not get to define that. Loving Jesus means keeping his word. It, when you think about it, this is a compelling statement because we're living in a day when some people come into a gathering like this and they sing songs that they love to a Jesus that they don't. Because we have to define loving Jesus by the same metric that he did. It's not about emotional responses. It's not about how we feel or whether we feel anything. 
It's about keeping his word. When Jesus commissioned his 12 disciples, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, he commissions them. He says, go out, make disciples of all nations and uh, preach this gospel, make disciples. And he, and he says, teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Teach them to observe. In other words, teach them to keep the same words that I taught you. Teach them to keep that. And so making disciples isn't just about making or teaching people to come to church. It's not just simply having people attend church meetings. It's about their life every day keeping the words of Jesus. That is what discipleship is all about. And so when we come together, it's a lot more meaningful when you come together with people who've been keeping his word every day of their lives. And you're all together, you're all disciples, and you're gathering as disciples. I don't know about you, but I, I wanna be a better person. Uh, at, I, I wanna be better at loving Jesus. I know that his love for me can't improve. His love is perfect, but my love is not always on the same level. I don't know, does that, does that fit for you too, maybe? The, uh, the Bible Knowledge Commentary says, Christ has set the pattern of love and obedience. His disciples are expected to follow. That, that's a great, yeah. See, yeah. there you go. That's good, thank you very much. <clears throat> You, you know, you collect more points in heaven if you say yeah, and even more points if you're taking notes on your phone or, you know, like all that is extra, the bonus points, bonus points. You'll find out when you get there. <clears throat> Number two, my father will love him. My father, Jesus said, if you keep my words, my father will love you. I will love you and my father will love you. Well, wait a minute, I thought God loved everybody. Well, that is absolutely true. God holds a redemptive love towards everybody on planet Earth and everybody who's ever lived on planet Earth. In other words, his love, his will is that they would not perish. His will is that they would come to life pass from death to life through the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they would come to the knowledge of the truth. That is his love. His love is that he sent Jesus so that they would have a means and a way to access relationship with him. And that is the highest good that he could do for anybody. Because even though people may live uh, in poverty or in sickness or in disease or in challenges of all kinds on this planet, there is an eternity ahead, and God lives there. He's already there. He's in eternity. And he knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end, and he understands that your life and my life are short, and sooner or later we're gonna pass through that veil of death into eternity, and God is saying, listen, I wanna welcome you here. That's why I sent my only beloved son, my only begotten son, my beloved son. And, and when Jesus, when the Father refers to Jesus as his beloved son, he's saying, this is the one I love. This is the one who, you know, has fully fulfilled all of my will, and I'm absolutely full of, my heart is full of love for him. So while God's love towards people is indisputable, all people, he's not always pleased with them. He's not always pleased with them. He's, and in fact, he's very displeased with the disobedience of people. So obeying the gospel and keeping his word brings us into the realm of covenantal love. We now pass from just being loved and God desiring that we would not perish and willing his best towards us. Now, in obeying the gospel, we have now become in Christ. We are in his beloved. And he has now got a covenantal love with us that is much, much uh, higher. It's on a whole new level. And that's why Paul writes in Ephesians chapter one, verse six, he said, 
as, as, as those who have obeyed Christ and obeyed the gospel, we are accepted in the beloved. The love that the Father has for Jesus is now the love that he has for us because we are in him. Isn't that amazing? And so, the Father loves the Son because he's obedient in all things, and he loves us because we're following in the steps of the Son of his love. Okay, number three. The third thing, the third significant thing that Jesus says here is that we become a spiritual home. We become a spiritual home. He said to his disciples that the Father and I will come, and we will make our home with you. If you keep my word, my Father loves you and I love you, and we will come and make our home with you. Well, how does that work? Is he referring to heaven? Is he referring to eternity in this verse? No, he's not. He's speaking in the context of the Holy Spirit. And he's trying to unpack the Holy Spirit to us and say, I'm, the Father and I are gonna come and make our residence, our home, with you. Well, how does that happen? What does that look like? Well, it, again, it's through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the active agent and, that is at work in everything that God does in our hearts and through our lives. We are now, in the New Testament, the temple. Think about it. In the Old Testament, they build this massive temple, Solomon's temple, and God said, I will put my name there, and, and he made a covenant and said, you know, if, if, if anybody is in distress or in trouble or whatever, and if, even if they're far away, if they will look towards this temple and pray, I will hear their, I will hear their prayer. Made a covenant. Just look towards that temple. Why? Because that's where his name was. That was his house on planet Earth. Well, today, it's not a temple. It's not a building like this. It's not a church. How many know this building is just like any other building? It's a building. But you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we are that house because we have the Holy Spirit. All his people, the church, are temples of the Holy Spirit where Jesus and the Father now reside by the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God. That should absolutely excite you to realize that God has come and taken up residence within you, and he loves you. This word that Jesus uses, that I will, we will come and make our home, it's a Greek word, uh, monin, which is a singular of another word, translated rooms in, in John 14, 2 where he says, my, my father's house has many rooms, but he's really saying many homes. It's the same word. It only, only occurs twice in the New Testament in this passage, in this discourse. is the only place where these, this Greek word appears talking about the home that the Father and him will come and make with us by the Holy Spirit. Now I wanna move to uh, the latter part of this chapter, starting at verse 25. Jesus says, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So my fourth point is that there's now an explicit introduction. It's in verse 26 that Jesus uh, perspicuously or explicitly for the first time, identifies the Holy Spirit. Before he said spirit of truth, he said helper, but he never ever used the word Holy Spirit. So now he says this is who we're talking about. We're talking about God. We're talking about the Holy Spirit of God. And so now it's clear that the helper, the spirit of truth is the spirit. 
and that the Father will send him in Jesus' name. Jesus wades into this kind of step by step, very carefully, uh, because the disciples for three and a half years have been connected to him. Think about it for a, a moment. Jesus shows up at the scene, a man, and they begin to relate to this man. They begin to, uh, their life is revolving around this man, Jesus Christ. Now he's saying, I'm going, I'm leaving. You now will have to transition from me being with you to relating to the Holy Spirit. I will be with you, the Father will be with you, but it will now be through the Holy Spirit. And so he's kind of spoon feeding these Galilean disciples because he doesn't want to blow their minds. He doesn't want them to miss it. He's just kind of giving it to them piece by piece by piece and setting them up to understand this is why this is important that I go away because I'm gonna go to the Father. You should rejoice about that. Not be sorrowful, but you should rejoice. I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. Now, there have been, you know, the, the, the relationship between the three persons of the Godhead has been subject of countless heresies and controversies for uh, a couple thousand years. But, but uh, we, we understand, and we're gonna touch on this in a, in a moment or two, on how we need to understand that relationship. But number five, Jesus says, a new teacher. So up until this point, we know the disciples called Jesus teacher, they called him master, we have him identified as rabbi, you know, some people call him rabbi, which basically means the same thing. But when they use the term master, it's not the way we would use it. In other words, they weren't saying to Jesus, hey, you know, this is the guy in charge, he's the master. You know, he's the master of their ship, master commander. But they use the term master in the sense that we would talk about someone who has a master of divinity or a, a, you know, a master's degree in any discipline. That, in other words, he's, he's studied, he is illumined, he is an expert, he has expertise in these areas. And so, Jesus is expanding the role in the ministry of the Spirit. He said, the Spirit of truth, he will teach you now. He will be your teacher. Well, you won't be, you won't be, you know, coming to me with your questions. You will now have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will be teaching you, filling your mind with understanding, giving you illumination of all the things that I've spoken to you, bringing those things to remembrance, and enlarging your understanding. You know, I may have shared this story before, but it, it, it's something I'll just share quickly with you now. When I first uh, was being moved upon, I'll put it this way. I, I believe an act of God's prevenient grace when I was not interested in Jesus or God or the Bible or anything else. If someone would have invited me to church, I would have laughed at them. Uh, I, I had never read the Bible. I was not interested in the Bible or God or anything else. But suddenly something began to happen within me and uh, something began to pique my hunger and my desire and uh, someone had shared the gospel with me, and from that moment forward, I just, something began to change. All I can say is something began to change in me, and I began to have an appetite for this. Well, I was, uh, began, I began to attend some Monday night uh, Bible studies with Christians. It was, a, it was a large group, probably almost the size of what's here this morning, of young adults that would gather together uh, at a meeting in, in Hamilton, and I was invited to this meeting by someone who shared Christ with me. And uh, after attending for a while, uh, someone I had met at work had in, invited me to a Baha'i meeting. So I'm not gonna get into all that, but it's a different religion that has its uh, roots in Iran. And, um, and so, you know, just being like open, maybe too open, I said, sure, I'll go. So I, start, I was going to, Christian Bible studies on Monday night, behind meetings, uh, other nights, and you know, I'm studying both. And finally, after about a year, it got to the point where I, I, I had completely uh, devoured all the teaching on the Baha'i faith, and so they turned to me one night and said, hey John, you know, you, you know it all now, you got it all, we've, we've downloaded it all into you, what are you gonna do with it? And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? And they said, well, you declare Baha'i, you fill in this little form, we send it to Haifa, and uh, you are now part of the world Baha'i faith. And I went, 
Oh, wow, okay. So where do I sign? So I signed up. But it, it wasn't until I was filled with the Holy Spirit, which happened sometime later, that I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I started going back to Christian Bible studies, and, I, and, and, and then I finally joined a church. You know, for me, Sunday morning was pretty hard to navigate because I was prostrate before the Lord every Sunday morning. Okay, think about that. It's gonna take a while. <clears throat> you know, for years I had made a practice of being uh, and staying in bed till I was up usually by the crack of noon. <laughs> and, uh, and so church was like, I'll go to the Monday night Bible study. Church is too early on a Sunday morning. And so um, after I finally joined a church and started going to church, Within a certain amount of time, I can't remember, the pastor laid hands on me, prayed for me, and I was mightily filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues in a profuse way. And, um, and it changed my life. Because up until that time, I, I still believed what the Baha'is taught. I just thought, it's not for me. You know, all, all roads lead to Rome, and they can take that road. I'm supposed to take this road. But I still thought, this is legitimate. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, no one said a word to me. The Holy Spirit began to unpack everything to my heart that was false about the Baha'i faith. I didn't need a teacher. I didn't have to write a book. I didn't have to talk to some ex-member. The Holy Spirit just opened it up from A to Z and said, this is why it's all false. Yeah, well, I was right. That is the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is talking about. He will teach you yeah. all things and will remind you of what I have said. So when Jesus said, the Fa I'm going to the Father, you need to rejoice about this because uh, it's, it's really going to you know, be uh, better for you. You know, Arians and, and Jehovah's Witnesses have argued with this statement for, uh, for a long time. Uh, saying that, see, this proves that Jesus is a lesser God. Uh, but this, this would make Jesus, if that was the right interpretation, this would make Jesus either a created being or it would lead us into polythe polytheism, uh, you know, the worship of many gods, both of which are clearly unbiblical and very easy to dispense with. And let me just say this, the Father and the Son share the same essence. The Father and the Son share the same essence. When Philip, when he was unpacking all this, Philip turned to him and said, Jesus, why don't you just cut to the chase here? This is the John Finocchio version. Um, why don't you just cut to the chase and show us the Father? And Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you so long and you don't know me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus put a face on God. He was the image, the express image of his being. Wow. So the Father and the Son share the same essence. The Father and the Son are one in purpose. And the Father is greater in office or glory than the Son was in his humiliation. In other words, when Jesus walked the earth, he was 100% man, and he was 100% God, right? Y'all with me? But when he was resurrected from the dead, and he ascended to the Father, again, he came into the glory of the Father, and he was seated at the right hand of the Father. So. The Father, in that sense, in his office of glorification was greater than the Son was in his humiliation. Number six, this is my last point. Say, Martha, he's at his last point now. We're gonna go home and have lunch. <laughs> Number six, the Spirit bears witness. So, the only passage in the 15th chapter of John, which Jesus begins to unpack again, 
uh, specifics of the Holy Spirit. You remember John 15, you know, I, this whole illustration of the, the vine and the branches, which if you really think about it, it's in the context of the Holy Spirit. I'm not gonna unpack it today, but, but it's, it's in the whole context of Jesus teaching the Holy Spirit. And he says, I'm the vine, the true vine, my father's the husbandman, if you abide in me, you know, and so on. And he begins to unpack all this. It's really talking about the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which, which brings us into communion with them and through which we bear fruit. You know, if you think of a vine, uh, yeah, Jesus is a true vine, but all the sap has to come up through that vine and be translated into the branches. How does that happen? It happens through the Holy Spirit. So again, it, he's still teaching on this, but in verse 26, he says when, again, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me and you will also bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. So now he's getting very specific with his disciples and he's saying, the spirit will bear witness of me. He's not gonna, he's, he's not gonna come and, and I get forgotten about, I get left behind. I, I was just like, we don't talk about Jesus anymore, we don't think about Jesus now, it's all the Holy Spirit. No, he's actually saying, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, the helper will enlarge me. He will, he will expand your understanding of me and everything that I am about to accomplish. Remember, he had not been to the cross yet. So the Holy Spirit is gonna come and he's going to testify of me. He is going to bring everything to you into your understanding and illuminate everything that has happened, everything that you're, you're soon to be very confused about and sorrowful about. Once you receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will teach you and expand and he will, he will speak to you. And because you know me, because you've been with me for three and a half years, you've tasted and touched and you know who I am, you will immediately bear witness and know that he is speaking of the master. He's speaking of the teacher, Rabbi Jesus. Amen? Yeah. And so today when we are receiving the Spirit, the Spirit is moving and working, instructing us, teaching us, bringing illumination. And that's how we know it's the Spirit of truth because he's leading us to Jesus. The Spirit is always leading us to Jesus and to the Father. He's always pointing to Jesus. He's always enlarging the work of the cross and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus and the words of Jesus. He's magnifying Jesus. That's how we know we've received the spirit of truth. And so Jesus, Jesus knew how essential to the formation of his disciples that the Holy Spirit was going to be. And Paul elaborates on this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, he says, but we all with unveiled face that's your face without your masks, <laughs> which you can take off when you leave this building. <clears throat> but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed. Think about this for a moment. With unveiled face now, in other words, nothing between us and God. We, see, we can behold him, we can see him. The Holy Spirit is revealing the glory of God to us and, and it is transformational. If you're going to be transformed, this is one of the major ways God will transform your life. Is as you look upon him, and the Holy Spirit, even if, you, if the most practical means, you open the word of God and pray that the Holy Spirit will teach you and show you. And as you're there, thinking and meditating upon that word, the Holy Spirit is showing you the glory of God. 
and it is working a transformation within you into the same image. Say, same image. Same. Yeah, into the glory of Christ's likeness from one level of glory to another level of glory to another level of glory to another level of glory until finally, one day, we will experience glorification. And glorification is that moment when we are transferred into his presence for eternity and we are glorified in his presence. Just as by, how does it happen? By the Spirit of the Lord. Without the Holy Spirit, there, this cannot happen. You and I can't change. You know, Jan and I went to visit a friend of ours, <clears throat> um, friends that we, we had way back, you know, we were 25 years in one church, so, so uh, we've been 22 years here, so I mean, this is way back. And we had this, this friend who, Jan actually lived with her for, uh, with some other girls for a number of years when she was single. And um, she had moved up to uh, Huntsville area with her husband that, that was, was in our church way back then. And they had now kids that were grown up. And so we were up in Huntsville a few summers back, I remember maybe five or six summers. And, um, and uh, we said, hey, let's, let's look up these people and see if they're still here and see if we can hang out. So we found them, we called them, and they said, hey, yeah, come on over. We'd love to visit with you. So we went over, and I had not seen him in you know, 25, 30 years, it's been a long time. And so we, we started talking and hanging out and Jan and Monica just went somewhere else in the house and me and Mike just stood there and talked and talked and he was asking me questions and I was talking and he was asking about our church and da 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 and what we did in ministry and blah, blah, blah. He was just asking me questions. And he had been backslidden for a number of years. In fact, I think at that point he was still backslidden. He was away from God but he was asking me a lot of questions. And so I, I was just delighted that he was asking and I was answering. And after about a half hour, 45 minutes, he turned to me and said, you know, John, I have never seen such a transformation in my life. I looked at him, I said, really? What do you, what do you mean? And he said, you used to be such a hard <laughs> And I said, really? As if I didn't know. <laughs> he said, you used to be such a hard ass. And he goes, and it just seems like I don't sense any of that in you at all. And I said, Mike, you just paid me the biggest compliment that I could ever received from anybody, that you knew me back then as a young Christian and what I was like, and now all these years later, you see a transformation that I have gone from glory to glory, amen? Yes. By the Spirit of the Lord. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Lord. And believe me, you should be thankful. You, my wife is. <laughs> you would not want to have sat under that guy. And in fact, you wouldn't have. We'd be lucky to have a few people here. But the Spirit helps us see more clearly the glory of the Lord. And by doing so, works transformation in our hearts. And Jesus knew how desperately we would need the Holy Spirit. How absolute the Christian life without the Holy Spirit is just absolute uh, duty and frustration because we're trying to become something that we, we're not leaning into the power and the empowerment and, and grace of the Holy Spirit to get there. And so without, and, and there are some groups who are that way. They, they do not embrace the fullness of the Spirit and I think that it's just, it's just incredibly frustrating to try to be a Christian and not embrace the fullness of the Spirit and walk with Him and pray in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, worship in the Spirit, have life in the Spirit. We desperately need the Spirit, the helper, the Spirit of truth, the one who would bear witness to Jesus throughout all generations 
and, make, and bring the church to a place of being a holy temple in the Lord. Holiness might seem far away for you, but I want to tell you, it's coming your way. If you just keep walking with God, you just keep continuing to fellowship with God and commune with the Spirit as much as you can. The great thing about, about the, the presence of God today is you can practice the presence of God wherever you are. You could be driving in your car, just don't shut your eyes. And, you know, well, pretty soon, you know, with uh, the AI technology, apparently you'll be able to shut your eyes. And just press the button and lift up your hands, spray in tongues, do whatever you want. But you can commune with God all day long. You can commune with God in your heart and your spirit. You can sing praise the Lord. You could be at, the, at your work banging in a hammer or working at the office or whatever you do, and you can be communing with God, fellowshipping with him throughout your day. And the Holy Spirit will water you, he'll strengthen you, he'll bless you, he'll edify you, he'll minister to you, and he will make Jesus real to you. Let's stand together. Amen. As we close our gathering this morning, I just wanna take a moment right now and, and pray with you, but I wanna ask that you would consider today if you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus. And I don't, I don't know everybody here, so I'm gonna ask you to just close your eyes, bow your head for a moment. Let's just close ourselves in with the Lord. And I wanna ask you today if, if you have never surrendered your life. I'm looking for people who have never asked Jesus who have never received the invitation that he issues to you to come to him and receive him as the son of the living God, your savior. And if you've never done that before, I'm gonna ask you maybe right now if you'd slip up your hand because Jesus wants you to know him. He wants you to be alive. He wants to bring life to you. He wants to bring salvation to you. And if that's you today, why don't you just slip up your hand right now, wherever you are, just slip up your hand. If you know you need to receive Jesus today, if that's you. All right, good. That means we're all knowing Jesus today. Let's pray. Would you just lift up your hands where you are right now and just say, Holy Spirit, come. Come and fill my heart. Come and fill my life to overflowing. I receive you as the teacher, the spirit of truth, the one who will illumine Jesus to my heart, magnify him, and fill me to overflowing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father God. Send him into my heart and fill me over and over again. Jesus name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Really appreciate. I know that we've had a bit of a shift here with the mask situation. Really appreciate you wearing those. Uh, it just really, uh, I just appreciate your cooperation. So God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the weather. Next couple of days, I think we're in for a seasonal change. Bless you.